start to understand uh, the types of work that we're trying to do. So um, I have two examples of, of, of recent studies that we've published that I wanted to share. Uh, the first kind of answers the question of what do infectious disease risks look like in communities that are near uh, large-scale swine operations and near cropland where swine waste is routinely applied? And then the second is if there are risks from those types of operations and from land application of swine manure, uh, what state and local agencies are, are available to protect citizens, and, and to what extent are they protecting citizens? Um, but before I do that, I want to give a little bit of background on, on, on sort of the world of industrial food animal production that I'll be talking about today. So food animal production has really changed dramatically um, in the last half century, maybe even longer. These are some data from the USDA National Agricultural Statistics Service just showing meat production over time since 1960. And, and what immediately smacks you in the face is that we're producing a lot more meat now than we have. Um, and, and within different types of animal production, we've seen some pretty substantial growth. I spent a lot of my time studying industrial poultry production, which you can see as by this figure it has experienced the largest growth in the last 60 years. But even with, within swine, which is what I'm going to really talk about today, there's been pretty considerable growth over the last half century. So, so this is an industry that continues to grow. Um, in addition to the volume of meat that we're producing, there have also been some pretty uh, significant changes to the way uh, that pigs are raised and that the actual meat is produced. So this is a figure using data from the same source that actually shows uh, the number of farms over time. In, uh, in the opposite line, the, the pinkish line, you actually see the number of animals per farm. And, and what you see is that there was really a sharp decline uh, starting in about 1960 uh, that we've seen all the way up to today in the number of farms actually producing swine. But what we see at the same time is kind of an inverse trend or opposite trend in the number of animals where the farms themselves are getting much, much larger. What's also interesting to recognize is that the geography of the industry has changed. And, and what we're actually left with now is uh, regions where, where swine production in particular is especially intensified. Uh, what you can see here is the, the two greatest areas of concentration uh, for swine production in the United States are, are the state of Iowa, uh, where things are quite intense, and also the state of North Carolina, which is the second leading swine producing state. There are a handful of other states where, where production is, is intensifying, um, as demonstrated by this one. So e each of the dots on this figure, by the way, represents a minimum production of 20,000 hogs or pigs in a single year. So this is a, a highly concentrated industry, very geographically concentrated. So I'm going to talk a little bit about antibiotics. Uh, I think we heard before about MRSA and some other infectious diseases, and that, that's a big part of what I'm going to talk about today. We're all very familiar with antibiotics, but um, what we may not be as familiar with is, is the, something called the epidemiologic shift. So in public health, we often talk about uh, a really important change that happened over the course of the 20th century where we essentially stopped dying of communicable diseases or, were, or they, they were responsible for a whole lot uh, less uh, deaths and we started dying from chronic diseases. Uh, and there are a number of different public health achievements that allowed us to actually live long enough to die from chronic diseases, basic uh, sanitation, improvements in food and water safety, uh, vaccines, and, and one of those major medical landmarks that has, has allowed us to live quite a bit longer uh, were antibiotics. And one of the concerns that I'd like to pose today is that the way that we're using these life-saving drugs in food animal production uh, may threaten their viability in the long term. And what that means is that we, we may enter a point in, in the future where we start to go back towards an era where we are more likely to die from a communicable disease than a chronic disease. So let, let's talk about antibiotic use in food animal production just for a moment. moment. Um, there are a lot of different types of antibiotic uses in our society. Uh, we use them in clinical medicine. They're, again, medical landmark. Um, we also use them in other types of agriculture that are uninvolved with animal production. We use them in crop production. Uh, there are certain types of orchards that are routinely sprayed with tetracycline. Uh, we use them in the production of corn for ethanol. Uh, we don't really have a good sense of the volume or the quantity of antibiotics used in those contexts, but we do have a better sense of what's used, or at least what's sold for use in animal agriculture. So we routinely administer 
uh, many of the same antibiotics that we rely on in human medicine to animals that we eventually plan to eat. And in, in, in many cases, in, in most cases, I'd argue, uh, we give those drugs to animals that are not sick or, or experiencing signs of disease. Um, we struggle, and this is a question I get all the time, we cannot put a specific number on uh, the fraction of the antibiotic resistance problem uh, that can be tied to their use in animal agriculture. But we have some insights that I'll talk about in a moment that give us a little bit of a sense of how big of a part of the problem it likely is. Um, so this is just a table that's probably challenging to see that, that shows um, the different types of antimicrobials that are used in food animal production. And what you'll see uh, or recognize if you've gotten a course of antibiotics in recent history is that many of these, not all of them, uh, are the same drugs that are used in, in clinical medicine to treat infections in people. So what's important to emphasize is that we, for the most part, do not have a separate set of antibiotics that we only use in animals, but instead these same drugs are the ones that we rely on on a, on a routine basis to treat our own infections. So that's an important point. So let's talk about volumes here. So one of the tough things about studying antibiotic use in animal production is that animal producers are not required to report the use of antibiotics uh, to anyone, not to federal agencies, not on packages. If you pick up a package of meat and you're curious about what drugs have been used to produce the animal that yielded that meat, uh, you have nowhere to go to find that information. The only exception to that rule is if you pick up an organic package of meat there is actually a, a regulatory program in place that ensures that those animals have not been treated with drugs. Um, but if you were to call the, uh, the name of the producer on the package of meat and, and ask them, hey, by the way, what drugs were used to produce this, this pound of hamburger I have, they have no obligation to tell you and they, they won't tell you, essentially. Um, what what uh, is reported in regards to antibiotic use is uh, the sales data. So drug manufacturers are required once a year to tell the FDA uh, the volumes of sales uh, for different antimicrobial classes. And we've recently been able to, uh, based on those FDA data, compare them to, to what, uh, to sales volumes of drugs used in clinical medicine. And we've learned that about 80% of the drugs that are sold in the US on an annual basis are sold for use in food animals, 80%. Uh, so that's a pretty stunning number, and when you think about the nature of drug use in food animal production, uh, it builds a pretty compelling case for antibiotic use in animals to uh, be responsible for a fairly large fraction of, of antibiotic-resistant infections we get in people. Um, there are two main concerns associated with antibiotic use, and I, I present these only to dispel uh, some concerns over one of them. So. The one that, that we are most worried about today is that when drugs are used in the context of animal production, uh, they are very likely to generate antibiotic resistant bacteria. And those bacteria can spread from farms and possibly infect humans and make them sick. Um, what seems to get a lot of uh, attention, although it really is far lesser of a concern, is that residues of those drugs that are fed to animals accumulate in meat. In some cases, that can be problematic. But I can tell you, um, based on our understanding of the problem, that the, the prospect of antibiotic-resistant infections is far more grave than encountering residues in meat. So what happens when you actually administer these drugs to animals? So imagine that, that these are some bacteria, and the bacterium that's shaded a little bit purple has a gene in it that allows it to survive in the presence of an antibiotic. Okay, so this is, this is imagine a farm setting. So in animal feed, we typically routinely feed uh, antibiotics. And, and this is, again, not just to sick animals, this is often to animals that are not sick at all for preventive purposes, is, is how it's called. Um, so we administer that antibiotic, and what happens is all, the, all the, uh, the bacteria that are not capable of surviving in the presence of it, we call them susceptible, they die off, and we have the one resistant bacterium that's still alive. And it takes advantage of the microbial ecosystem that's no longer being uh, utilized by the other dead bacteria, and it reproduces. So if you can imagine, uh, we're actually administering maybe a handful of antibiotics at the same time. We are, are essentially selecting for bacteria that are really hardy, really able to live, persist, survive, propagate in the presence of these drugs. And again, these are the drugs that we use to treat ourselves when we're sick. So you don't want to become infected with these bacteria, because if you are, 
it can be really, really tough to successfully treat that infection. It can lead to some very serious consequences. And so if these bacteria stayed on farms, it would be better. It wouldn't be perfect, but it would be a lot better. Um, but they don't stay on farms. Um, and again, I, I, you know, I talk about these problems to a lot of different people, sometimes media outlets, and what everybody cares about is, what am I gonna get at the grocery store? And, and that's a valid concern. No one wants to buy a package of meat and become infected with resistant bacteria. Um, but what people don't think about, and what I think we here today are most concerned about, are, are that these bacteria can find their way into communities. So I wanna be careful not to vilify people who work in food animal production sites because in many cases these people are at greatest risk and they're often from disadvantaged backgrounds and don't have a lot of say in, in drug use or in, in production protocols but anyway these people have the most contact with the animals the most contact with the feed and most importantly the most contact with the waste and they themselves can become infected or they can be carriers of bacteria that are resistant to drugs What's also very important, and we, we already heard uh, Gordon and, and Lynn talk a lot about manure, is that manure from these operations that is often uh, highly concentrating antibiotic resistant bacteria is then spread in, into the environment. So it has to be trucked. There are many opportunities via the trucking, uh, as you saw before, uh, for resistant bacteria to find their way away from the truck. Um, and, and, and then, of course, uh, they're spread, depending on the type of manure, maybe by spray irrigation onto agricultural land. And one thing I have to kind of uh, share with my friends who are vegetarians who might only eat organic produce is that uh, this waste from, from conventional CAFOs can be sprayed on agricultural land even in cases where produce that's being grown there is certified organic. So even if you are not a meat eater, even if you are, are not directly uh, supporting these practices, you, you may be affected by them. So it, it's, it's difficult. So we really uh, need to work together to try and solve this problem. So, I showed you some of the main pathways that we're most worried about, but I wanted to sort of share some of the other ones. I talked about farm workers and animal waste. Um, sources of water near production sites can easily become contaminated. Um, what I think a lot of people aren't thinking about is that there's some sort of atraditional or atypical vectors for resistant bugs to travel from farms. Um, colleagues of mine have looked at flies that have been captured at residences near animal production sites and uh, we've been able to isolate antibiotic resistant bacteria from those flies. Uh, rodents and other non-domesticated animals are pretty effective vectors at, at spreading these bugs from farms. And uh, really interesting studies some colleagues of mine conducted. Um, they followed animal transport trucks, and these were poultry transport trucks, and they, they would uh, swipe the car down, clean it off pretty well, and then follow a truck for a mile, and then see if they could isolate any bacteria off the surface of their cars. And they found they were able to, to isolate resistant staff off of the surface of their car after following a chicken transport truck for a mile. So trucks themselves can be sources of, of antibiotic resistant bacteria in the communities. So this stuff sadly gets around. Um, antibiotic resistant infections are, are an enormous burden uh, in the U.S. healthcare system. The CDC in 2013 released a report trying to quantify it, and they found that about um, 23,000 people on an annual basis die, actually die, from antibiotic resistant infections. Uh, and each year uh, in the healthcare system, we address about 2 million resistant infections. Um, and, and CDC really acknowledges that this estimate is kind of the tip of the iceberg. This is what they've been able to, to confirm. Um, sadly, again, you know, due to, to sources of, uh, due to the difficulty in trying to pin infections back to sources, it's tough to know what fraction of this has to do with animals. But CDC finally has begun to acknowledge that, animal, uh, that antibiotic use in animal agriculture may be a big, big part of this. Uh, and they produced a prioritized list of infectious agents. And what you, you probably can't see because the font is so small is that MRSA, or Methicillin Staph aureus, is under the serious threats list. So there is a growing recognition of some of these specific uh, infectious risks uh, that are a result of, of these types of production. So what does it mean to actually get an antibiotic resistant infection? So again, the idea here is that if a bacterial infection is antibiotic resistant, if you try and treat the bacteria with a drug that it resists, that treatment won't work. And so sometimes what we do when we treat an infection is we, we use a slew of, of commonly used drugs and, and, and that treatment will fail. 
in, in the period of time where the treatment fails, the infection can become more severe, and then we'll try other treatments until we finally find one that works. Now, antibiotic-resistant infections uh, are, are a greater burden for a lot of reasons. One, because of those, you know, sometimes repeat treatment failures, these infections are more likely to become invasive and require a more exhaustive treatment, and in some cases, surgery. Um, they're more expensive to treat. One estimate looking at MRSA as compared to a more susceptible Staph aureus found that it cost about five times more to treat a MRSA infection than a susceptible Staph infection. And, and your, your stay in a healthcare facility, if you're infected with a resistant bug, is, is sometimes more than twice as long uh, just to resolve that infection. So uh, there have been a lot of estimates at, at what resistant infections cost society. Um, but some I've seen are in the neighborhood of, of 12, sorry, 17 to 26 billion per year. And again, I have to caveat that, you know, we don't know exactly how much of this is from food animal production, but, but we believe it's a very large fraction of that. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the first of two studies today. So one of the questions that's been on our minds and, and on the minds of, of folks in the scientific community who, who focus on public health is, uh, you know, given the way antibiotics are used in swine operations and in, in generally in food animal production, um, what is the risk to surrounding communities? Uh, and we wanted to ask that question specifically for MRSA and for, for unspecified skin and soft tissue infections. So this is the thesis work of a woman named Dr. Joan Casey who just finished up recently. Uh, it was published in, in JAMA Internal Medicine, which is a pretty good place to, to publish a scientific study. And, and I want to walk you through what we did and what we found. Um, so MRSA has been a, a long recognized um, clinical infection. And for the longest time, MRSA was really thought to be a disease that occurred in people who had a lot of contact with the healthcare system, usually in folks who were a lot older. But in the, in the mid-1990s, uh, we started to see MRSA infections in people who were not older, who were maybe younger and healthier, and who didn't have a lot of contact with the healthcare system. And, and some genetic analyses had, had helped us understand that, that, those, that the origins of those MRSA infections likely were not healthcare facilities. Um, these infections were often uh, found as, as skin and soft tissue infections rather than things that might have resulted from, from uh, maybe a surgery or, or dialysis. Um, and over time, these sort of community-associated MRSA strains had become more dominant than the more traditionally viewed healthcare-associated MRSA strains. Uh, so we wanted to look at, at some of these community-associated MRSA strains and see if it was likely that they may have originated from uh, animal production sites or crop fields. So we wanted to uh, take patients uh, from something called the Geisinger Health System. That, this is a, a very large uh, health uh, network in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, and they uh, do something really, really special if you're interested in studying uh, people in public health. They have electronic health records. So we had very high quality data on lots of people over time. And what we were able to do is take nearly half a million pac patients from their electronic health system. And we were able to look to see what fraction of them had MRSA, and then divide them out based on certain risk factors into those that likely had a healthcare-associated strain of MRSA, and those that likely acquired MRSA somewhere else in the community. Uh, and, and with those, we were able to um, examine uh, their potential sources of exposure to swine CAFOs and to crop fields where uh, manure from swine CAFOs had been applied. You see a couple of better pictures actually today of swine CAFOs, but this is a, a, a typical picture of a swine CAFO in the state of Pennsylvania. And what you can see here is that large brown rectangle is, is a manure lagoon. And so we were interested in not only looking at the operations themselves, which is what most previous studies had done, but we were interested in seeing if you lived near a place where swine manure was routinely applied, was that a risk factor for developing uh, community-associated MRSA? And one of the unique advantages of this study that we performed is that a lot of the previous work had looked at colonization in people. And what that means is it, it's not infection. So um, you could be colonized with MRSA. I bet there are a good fraction of us in this room that are colonized with MRSA staff in our noses and we may never progress to actually having a clinical infection, whereas the power of using these electronic health records is we were able to identify people who were actually infected and, and use them in our analysis. So that was pretty big. That had not been done before. So Dr. Casey, when she was doing the work uh, for this study, um, 
had to spend quite a bit of time driving around to local health authorities uh, to actually uh, collect the data about the locations of swine farms in the state of Pennsylvania. At the time we did this, there was not a nice online database that, that uh, gave us the locations of the operations and the nutrient management plan. So she actually had to go with a little hand scanner and go to some of the local health authorities and, and you know, spend a lot of time scanning. And it was a lot of work. And so once she actually acquired the data, she mapped it. And so this is a map of some of the different operations around the state of Pennsylvania. And what you can see is that the larger uh, the red dot, uh, the greater the density of, of animals in a given location. Um, and then what she did was based on those nutrient management plans I described, she used three different approaches to map where renewable was applied in the state of Pennsylvania. She, so she was able to build a map of, of uh, manure, essentially. And so what we were able to do then is take the patients from the Geisinger Health System and plot them on a map of Pennsylvania that also had maps of the operations themselves and of crop fields uh, where animal waste was routinely applied. And based on that, we were able to assess the relationship between how close you lived to a swine operation and the likelihood of you uh, acquiring community-associated MRSA, or how close you live to crop fields where manure is applied and your likelihood of developing the same conditions. And so what we found, and these numbers are probably not very helpful to most people, and that's okay, uh, we found significant association, so that means evidence of a relationship uh, between living near a, a large-scale swine operation or living close to a crop field where swine waste is applied and community-associated MRSA uh, and skin and soft tissue infections. We also found a significant relationship uh, between uh, living near one of these operations or a crop field and healthcare associated MRSA, which would suggest that some of the same strains that we may be finding in hospitals uh, may actually be originating from communities. Um, so we, we did find evidence of a meaningful relationship. So we, we concluded based on this study that, you know, as I described before, living near a large, uh, large scale swine site or a crop field was uh, significantly associated with, with risk of MRSA. Uh, and we also were able to estimate, based on our data, the fraction of MRSA cases that likely would go away if we were able to remove the exposure. So if we were able to end uh, land application of swine manure, uh, what we would expect to see is a reduction in the cases of community-acquired MRSA of about 11%. So that would suggest that they, they are playing an, an important role in infectious disease risks uh, in these communities. There are some other studies that are, that are being conducted by other folks. One was published in 2014. Uh, sadly, they didn't have data about infections. They only had data about colonization, so they'd swap people's noses to look for MRSA, but they found similar results, that living close to a, a swine operation is a risk factor for being able to, to get uh, MRSA out of, out of a nose swab. So anyway, uh, it, it's helpful and supportive <coughs> to know that there are other locations where this has been studied and, and the same types of results are so um, with that, I wanted to shift uh, to the sort of second case study that I'm doing today. So hopefully I've made a case by, by explaining what we saw in the first study that um, living near one of these operations or a crop field may be a risk factor for certain types of infectious conditions. But the question we had next uh, was if you are uh, facing, uh, if you're living in a community that, that's dealing with these types of operations, what types of recourse do you have in terms of, of working with your state or local agencies to protect yourself if you have a complaint or a concern? Um, I talk about this stuff at public meetings sometimes, um, and something that we often hear from, from certain members of the community is, if there are really health risks, the health department would be aware and involved. And uh, we'd heard from members of the community anecdotally that that couldn't be further from the truth. But um, when a statement like that is made, you know, as a scientist, I, I'd like to have some evidence to bring with me to at least object to it, and, and I want to point to a paper we've published. So, so while that may seem uh, completely obvious to everyone in this room, we needed to prove it first. So we had four research questions going into this. Um, we wanted to know, are state and local government agencies ever contacted about food animal production sites with complaints, nuisance complaints, et cetera? And if they are, how do they respond? And if they aren't fully responsive, if they're not feeling like they're able to do anything to, to respond to citizen concerns, um, what are the barriers that would prevent them from doing that? Uh, 
And then we also wanted to talk to people in, in communities and say, you know, what, uh, what's your experience when you try and, and contact a local health authority? Uh, do you feel like they're responding to you or do you feel like they're not able to help you? And so what we did is we, we decided to pick one type of animal and we picked swine. Uh, and so we picked eight states in the U.S. We had limited resources, couldn't look at every swine producing state. But, but remember I showed you before that the industry is very tightly geographically concentrated in a handful of states, so we hit on a lot of the important ones. Um, and we picked counties within those states based on, on ag census data. So we were able to look at counties and states that had the densest hog production and or the greatest growth in hog production over the last five years. So we wanted to really capture both sides of things. So these are places with lots of pigs or getting a lot more pigs very quickly. And we did semi-structured telephone interviews with 21 different health departments. Not everybody wanted to talk to us. So we talked to health departments in 13 counties and eight states. All the state health departments did talk to us. We identified a community member from every state uh, we talked to seven different state permitting agencies, so these are like the DEP equivalents in the various states, and we tried to talk to all the agriculture departments, and five of them were willing to talk to us. Some, some were not willing to talk to us. No one has to talk to us, but we like it when they do. So I wanted to start with what we found from talking to the health departments. And we found that they do get complaints, um, and it ranged depending on, on who we spoke to from a few times a year to a few times a month. And some, in some cases, were not contacted. And I'll get back to why that is a little bit later. Um, what they were contacted about was often odor. Odor was really the driving concern. Uh, but in, in some cases, people were concerned about water quality, uh, respiratory health outcomes like asthma, and just general health concerns. Um, we found that record keeping was really, really rare among the health departments. And, and in many cases, it was because the health departments felt and there wasn't a whole lot that they could do, um, mostly because the jurisdiction of, of dealing with uh, some of the releases from CAFOs uh, lied in another agency. So they would typically refer people who called them to other agencies like a Department of Environmental Protection. Um, permitting agencies like DEP and DNR were really, really were sending folks. Um, so I want to show you a couple of quotes from some of the different people we talked to. Um, <coughs> One member of the state and county health department staff said the best we can do is bring it to the operator's attention and hope they take care of it voluntarily. Yeah, it says a lot, doesn't it? Another is we have no control over manure spreading or manure management. All we can do is consult with the farmer to try and work with them. And, and I, I didn't print any of the quotes here, but you can imagine that wasn't often a very successful uh, endeavor. Um, so we asked them, why, why, couldn't, you, why couldn't you do more? Um, and jurisdiction was, was the, the most frequently cited reason. Um, you know, the, the permitting of these operations lies as a responsibility of another agency. So uh, there isn't a whole lot we can do. Um, you know, I, I like to avoid vilifying uh, state and local health departments. I have worked with some folks in these, in these organizations, and they're often spread very thin. They're not paid very well. Uh, they have very few resources, and, and so they're dealing with mandates for which they are underfunded. And this is something for which many of them get no funding to deal with and, and have no training or expertise to deal with. So I can kind of understand why they aren't the most effective in, in helping respond to citizen concerns. That doesn't mean that I think it's okay that they don't, but, but it's understandable. Um, there are often uh, political factors, too, that I think are, are really critical to acknowledge as well. So uh, these types of operations are typically not cited in, in very uh, densely populated areas. And in many cases, these are small communities where you may know everyone in the town. In fact, you may have a relative that is the operator of the CAFO in question uh, as, as someone who works at a health department. So it may be challenging to navigate some of those family or political relationships in order to try and enforce a change, even if you feel like you're empowered to force a change. So, so that certainly can get in the way. Uh, health departments often are subject to political pressures from county councils or other state entities, and that can really interfere with your ability to be effective. Um, and there's also a, a perception that CAFOs are economically critical to communities, and that if the CAFO were to have to stop functioning, it would, it would rupture the economic fabric. And, I, and while I, I think there's a lot of evidence to the contrary, 
uh, those are the assumptions under which many of these state and local jurisdictions operate, and, and uh, that's a reality in their ability to respond to citizen concerns. Yeah. So when we talked to folks in communities, uh, not surprisingly, they reported very little engagement uh, from the health departments. And many of them said, you know what, when we first started to have this problem here, we contact them all the time. And then we learned how effective it was to contact them about these problems. And we gave up. We just stopped calling because we know they're not going to help. And, and so in many of the cases before where I mentioned health departments say they don't get calls, it's likely because people have learned that there's not a whole lot of return on investment in that, so they just stop. Um, the community members, when we asked them why they think it didn't work, they, they cited some of the same problems I mentioned. The health department may not have the resources to respond. They may face some of the political barriers I spoke of. And the industry is very engaged in making sure that the health department does not get in the way of business. And that is an undeniable truth. So they understand the landscape they're up against in many cases. And in some communities, the people we contacted have very, very little social capital. If you don't have some money and you don't have training and you don't understand how to influence policy, which is, is not uncommon at all, you're not going to have a lot of luck better in your situation. Um, and, and so we did hear from citizen groups that they had a lot of creative ways to try and solve the problem, but we found a, a, a malaise among them. They, they, they struggled to really uh, better their situations, and it was, it was difficult to hear some of those responses. Um, when we talked to some of the permitting uh, and departments of agriculture, um, we heard that they'd all been contacted, actually. We didn't find anyone that really hadn't. The permitting agencies are typically where people went when they wanted to get something done. Um, the complaints they got were not all that different from the ones that the health departments had gotten, because the health departments were referring people to the permitting agencies. Um, they tended to do a little bit more. They would gather some information, sometimes inspect. Uh, and in a lot of cases, I thought this was interesting, the permitting agencies would refer people to ag trade associations. I don't really understand the logic there, because I don't see them being very inclined to do much, but that happened. They occasionally had records, uh, and in, in some cases those records could be made available through state information laws to people who were interested. Um, but uh, keeping records by itself doesn't do a whole lot. Um, the ag departments we talked to would occasionally investigate, which was encouraging. I didn't even expect that much. And sometimes they'd refer to the permitting agencies or the health department. And again, so it's the cycle of inactivity. Not a whole lot was done. Um, but they did say uh, that health departments should get involved because if we're talking about health concerns, they're the ones with the most expertise. But you know, we, we spoke to the health departments and asked, you know, generally, are you aware of any health issues associated with food animal production. And we had to be very careful in our language to not bias them. I think it's easy to say, do you think factory farms are killing people? You know, <laughs> we, we might get a different response than if we presented the information a little more objectively. And, uh, and we had a lot of folks say, you know, we, we have an understanding that something may be going on, but we don't have direct training in, in understanding what these operations mean for health. And so there's, there's only so much we could really do, even if we had jurisdiction. So here's some of the quotes from the permitting agencies. There used to be more calls about odor, but there are no odor regulations, so there's nothing we can do about it. The public learned there's no point in calling about odor complaints. If the problem is not covered under the agency, it might be a phone call or email to let people know why we can't address their concerns. Water issues are our primary jurisdiction. There are no state or federal regulations over air emissions, which is true. So really, these agencies could not do much. Uh, here, a couple more. If anyone's going to address health issues, it would have to be the health departments. From our perspective, we really don't have expertise in that area. And obviously, the health department has more expertise in the health area than us. So really, uh, the permitting agencies, the ag agencies, did not feel that they were empowered to do much either. In terms of their barriers, uh, the permitting agencies cited limited budgets, staff size, and political factors. So this isn't all that different from the health departments minus the whole jurisdiction thing. Uh, they, uh, in more than a couple of situations, uh, noted that they were a little worried about some of the influence of the local trade groups and some of the local industry groups uh, who, who actually could come after them uh, through legal channels. Uh, and, and ag, because they had a more limited authority over these types of operations, were not as concerned with the same things. So anyway, what we learned from conducting that study, which is probably something many of you could have guessed before even hearing me talk about it, is that health departments do not play a big role in responding to some of these concerns. And they gave a lot of reasons, uh, jurisdiction and political factors, expertise and resources, 
Um, we found that some of the state and, and local permitting and agriculture agencies may have had more means to do something, but often that meant just keeping records and maybe doing site inspections. They didn't really have an enforcement arm that allowed them to uh, minimize exposures. Um, and, and so what we found, you know, sort of at the end of the day, is there are, are wide gaps in a system that, that really should be uh, there to protect citizens from concerns or should be responsive to citizen concerns. And we found that, you know, like uh, many of the folks we've worked with at some of those public meetings, uh, they didn't know where to go uh, to, to find a response to some of their health concerns and their, their state and local agencies were not equipped to actually provide the responses they need. So that was a, a, a major um, gap. So um, one thing that I've learned over the last 10 years working on these issues is that there really is a growing evidence base and we're part of that evidence base um, for decisions that make public, uh, that, that promote public health. Uh, we're continually conducting studies to fill in some of the gaps in knowledge about how these type of operations may make people sick. Um, what I, I can, I, I have this slide that says despite this not enough measurable policy progress, um, things are changing over time and we're actually starting to see more policy progress. I, I heard recently here in Bayfield that there's a, a year-long moratorium on, on new operations and that is the type of progress that it is helpful to see and, and a place like Bayfield could really serve as a model for other places where an industry like this could be coming in. Uh, so we have had some small, maybe some not so small victories. Um, and, and actually having success with some of these movements requires evidence, but not just the evidence, but someone who's willing to talk about it. Uh, and actually uh, maybe write a letter uh, to a county council to actually synthesize what we know from a public health perspective or from an economic perspective about what a movement of this industry in your community would actually mean for the health and, and well-being of citizens. Um, so I don't know if any of you have seen this book in the back. Uh, this is a report uh, that, that I and some others at the CLF published looking at some recommendations that were made by the Pew Commission on Industrial Food Animal Production they made uh, some landmark recommendations for how to change agriculture to, to promote health and, and well-being and, and, and move in a more sustainable direction. And that was about six years ago now. So we released this last year. It was sort of a five-year status report or status update on those recommendations. And I wrote what I think is the most depressing conclusion I've ever written in that we found that after five years, those recommendations have, have not been heeded. So uh, I, I think it's a powerful read. It can be useful in trying to communicate with, with people who have the power to make decisions about whether or not these type of operations are successful. So I would encourage you to pick up a copy in the back of the room. If we run out, it's online. I can direct you to it. Um, what I also wanted to share with you is another document that I did not bring copies of. Uh, just to show you sort of an even-handed perspective, uh, two days before we released our report, the uh, Animal Agriculture Alliance, which is a trade association for industrial agriculture, released a preemptive report saying that we were wrong. Um, I, I found it to be a very engaging read. Uh, it, it does not contain any references to scientific literature. In, in comparison, ours has about 160, and not that counting them makes anything, but we like to try and pretend that we're not making it up as we go along. This other report, not, not so much. Um, so so if, you, if, you're, if you're in for a, a laugh, have a look at that one. Um, and I, I guess I want to make one last plug for a colleague of mine. Um, Every so often, the USDA releases dietary guidelines, and I think for the first time, the committee that advises the USDA on dietary guidelines has advocated for a shift towards a diet that is uh, richer in, in plant-based proteins and, and less uh, comprised of, of, of proteins from animal products. Uh, and and uh, Secretary Vilsack of the USDA has said that he will not incorporate uh, considerations of sustainability uh, in the dietary guidelines when they are released. So there's a petition this colleague of mine, Dr. Jillian Fry, put on change.org that would advocate for Dr. Vilsack, I'm sorry, uh, Secretary Vilsack, to actually incorporate some of those concerns about sustainability into the dietary guidelines in uh, giving folks advice about what uh, diets need to eat. So if you have a chance to go on change.org, uh, I think Dr. Fry would really appreciate uh, your support. So anyway, with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm looking forward to Dr. Eggers' talk. <laughs>